So uh, today, we're excited. I, at least I am, because I like to talk about this stuff. Well, that's uh, good news. Yeah, we've got uh, Sean McDonald on our show. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. good. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, we're... This is, uh, I think when we started talking about doing this format, this was, I think this is probably the first thing we talked about, right? Getting Sean on here. Yeah, getting Sean on here. Well, uh, it goes well with your educational background as well. Well, yeah, because I'm, I'm kind of like you in that I have a criminal justice degree. Yeah, that's what John was saying. Yeah. I don't use it, but I have it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't You're going to use it, it tonight? Yeah, yeah I guess go. so. I guess. It's been a while since I've, uh, since I've heard about it or talked about it, but uh, definitely was a, was really the reason why I did it was because when I sat down with my counselor because I first started off business and I took my first uh, calculus class and I said okay well I have to change this this isn't working out for me I said what can I do and she started showing me all the stuff that criminal justice does I was like well that seems cool I'll do that is that kind of how you I, I I was well I was wanting to go into federal law enforcement okay so everybody told me to get an accounting degree and that's the easiest way in and I'm like okay I'll get an accounting degree and I uh Took my first accounting class. Yeah. And the same thing. I'm like, this isn't for me. Yeah. So I went back. I'm like, how about a criminal justice degree? And she showed me all the classes. And I'm like, okay, I, I, can, I can dig that. So I was, that's kind of my route. It's, okay. It's still federal law enforcement, but I was not going to do accounting. Accounting. So accounting to federal law enforcement, how does, how does, what does that correlate? They want bean counters. They want very focused, fine, detailed individuals who can, Hey, look, if you can read a spreadsheet and do accounting, yes. you have the ability to really focus and be very detailed oriented. Okay. And that's, you know, that's a lot of the logistics and, and things that the FBI is looking for. Okay. Well, because is that kind of what you were wanting to do FBI, I right? was wanting to do FBI. Okay. So it wasn't local law enforcement or anything like that. That was strictly what you were wanting to do. That was it. And, I, and I, I, that wasn't my, my want or desire necessarily, but as I got into it, that's kind of where I was leaning was, okay, this seems cool. I can do the FBI. But then you start to learn that, at least where I was, they really wanted, they were really pushing you more towards local, like probation officers, you mm -hmm. know, that kind of job. And I remember I went on a little visit with a probation officer and kind of saw what he did. And I said, well, I'm going to check that one off. I'm, I'm good there. I don't want <laughs> I don't, I don't to I don't go this route. That didn't, that didn't work for me. So, um, but yeah, Sean McDonald's local attorney, uh, local criminal law attorney, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. So I guess for people that don't know, tell, tell a little bit about what you do here locally. Um, I, was, I came out here in 2004 as a prosecutor. So I worked in the DA's office for a couple years and frankly, I couldn't afford it anymore. So I decided to open my own practice um, and start doing defense work. Okay. Um, started doing that in 2006. And then since 2006, I've been in the Fort Bend County area because it's, it's been kind of like a home to me because I started out here as a prosecutor and I yeah. know everybody. Mm -hmm. So it just was my, my comfort area. So okay. um, since 2006, I've been, I've been practicing criminal defense out here. And, and, you know, the system is as good as you can find in the state of Texas. I really, really enjoy Fort Bend County. I, the, the judges and the prosecutors and, and all the court staff and, and DA staff, they're all friends of mine. It just makes it an easy process for me, it makes it fun to work. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, being surround, surrounded by people that you, you know, really enjoy, you like being around. Right. It makes it pleasurable. All right, so tell us about what you do locally here in uh, Sugar Land and Houston area as far as criminal law goes. All right, so I grew up um, just north of here in the Woodlands. And, okay. I uh, went to law school in St. Mary's in San Antonio, and right out of law school, I was wanting to be a prosecutor and a uh, DA's office in East Texas in uh, Henderson County. Okay. Um, hired me directly out of law school and put me in a felony court, and I was the only prosecutor in the court and handed me a docket and said, go to work. Yeah. Um, and so I did that for almost three and a half years, ran along with our task force, our drug task force for quite a while, and then um, had the opportunity to move back closer to home and move in, uh, go into the Fort Bend County DA's office. Okay. And then I did that in 2004, and I stayed there almost two years, and then I left in 2006 and opened my own firm. Okay. Um, and I've been out here practicing surrounding counties, mostly Fort Bend County, but I do a little bit of Brazoria work, a little bit of Harris County work, but vast majority of my practice is here is Fort Bend County. Okay. So... Where did you get your criminal justice degree? Ultimately from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Okay. For right. really no good reason other than my buddy said there's golf skiing in the beach <laughs> and you want to go to North Carolina <laughs> and I'm like, sign me up, let's go. Yeah. And they had a good criminal justice degree yeah. program yeah. Um, and I just needed to get out of Texas. I'd played football several places in Texas and all my friends lived around and I just was not on a, a path that I was real happy with. So I just needed to get away from the distractions and 
Buddy and I just packed our stuff up, and moved out to North Carolina, and I graduated okay. from there in uh, December of '97 with a criminal justice degree. Okay, so you knew when you were leaving, when you're going to college or looking for college, you want to do criminal justice. I knew I wanted to do criminal justice. Um, just not necessarily that degree. I, w I knew I wanted to go in the FBI. Okay. And so I was searching for, I thought, the best route to get me in the FBI. Yeah. And uh, like we talked about earlier, the first thing was accounting. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not cut out to be an accountant. Me neither. Um, I switched to criminal justice. Yeah. And then I was kind of just debating on where I wanted to go from there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's actually a funny story. I was I'm at my grandfather's funeral September, October of 97, several months before I graduated from college. Yeah. And my dad's best friend and I ended up in the same car going from the service to the gravesite. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he said, do you want to uh, go in the FBI or you want to run the FBI? Okay. And I'm like, look, I'm a 20 year old little punk kid. Right. I just want to get in Franklin. And he's yeah. like, I know you well enough. I've yeah. known you your entire life that, yeah. that, that you, that's not going to satisfy you. He mm -hmm. said, don't set your, your sights too low. He said, you want to run the FBI and you're not going to do anything in the FBI unless you get a law degree. And I'd never even considered law school. Never for one moment had thought about it. Mm -hmm. And he says, you need to go to law school. And I was like, if that's what you think is the best route for me to be in the FBI, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I got back to North Carolina, applied to law school. There were only two um, programs that still were available. And St. Mary's in San Antonio was one of them. And I got accepted. And I went to law school eight months later, nine months later, mm -hmm. and had really no inclination before that that I wanted to go to law school. No. Just one of those what I commonly refer to as a God wink. Yeah. Just that yeah. opportunity presented itself and, and I found myself in law school and I can't imagine doing anything different than I do now. What was the other really opportunity? Cool. What was the other, you said St. Mary's, you said there were two. South Texas it? here in Houston. Okay. And I yeah. didn't want to be that close to home. No, that's not, that's, you know, <laughs> families want me to come home all the time and I needed to get away. Yeah. Too many distractions. All my buddies were out of school and living in Houston. And I was like, I law school and on all your buddies that have just graduated just isn't going to jive. So were you wanting to do the, the criminal part of it? I mean, were you wanting to go the prosecutorial route at first, or were you wanting to do the corporate and do all that stuff? It's always criminal. Yeah? Yeah. I'm always, I've always been interested in criminal justice or federal law enforcement, and then halfway through law school, um, I decided that I wanted to be a prosecutor. Okay. And so that's the, the route I took. So you had the intentions when you started of doing FBI still, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then, I don't know, a year and a half in, I kind of – decided that I wanted to be on the law side of it, not just the investigation special agent side of it. Okay. What was it? Well, I mean, why, wh why did you want to do that? Do you know, looking back on it? I had an internship with the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals after my first year, the summer of my, summer after my first year, mm -hmm. I had an opportunity with the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, which is the, it's the highest ranking criminal court in Texas. It's the Supreme Court of Texas for criminal cases. Okay. Um, and had the opportunity to clerk for the presiding judge, Michael McCormick. Mm -hmm. And just being around him and seeing the process of the criminal system and case law and reading opinions and transcripts of prosecutors and defense attorneys kind of, I think, shifted my direction from FBI and federal law enforcement into being a prosecutor. Because you like, you like being in the courtroom. I didn't realize it at the time because I'm not a, I never was a public speaker. Okay. I, it terrified me, especially in high school. I was, I was, it was horrific. Yeah. And it, I just, once I started getting comfortable with criminal law, mm -hmm. it, it felt much easier. Um, and it's, you know, it's just like anything else. When you, when you learn about something and you feel like you are very competent in it, it's right. easy to talk about. Okay. I mean, and I think that's kind of the route that I took is criminal law is my, it's what I'm comfortable with. I, I know criminal law. And so it makes it easy for me to talk about getting up in a courtroom and talking about it. Mm -hmm. I'm extremely comfortable. Now, if you talk, ask me to talk about family law or personal injury, yeah, man, I'm not your guy. Okay. But it just was a, it's just a comfort level. It just kind of felt like it was natural for me. Okay. All right. Do you, so what, what are your going from uh, prosecution office to defense now? Um, how often are you in trial do you think how often are you in a courtroom four out of five days a week four out of five days usually almost every morning mm -hmm. usually wednesdays we'll have off mm -hmm. we're not in court on wednesdays yeah but every other day we're typically in court at some point okay all right and so was it because in my experience at least what you hear about people when they go from a prosecution office to a defense attorney it's it's 
the, the income, it's the money. I mean, is that the driving force behind that? Or is it, is it also wanting to help people and to defend them and to, to do that? I mean, is, what's, what's the motivation there? I mean, I wish I had a good answer for that, but that it, frankly, it was money. Really? I mean, I wish there was something more telling and more in depth that I could share with you. But at, at the time, I, 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 I came out for money, simply money. I knew I was capped out in the DA's office. Yeah. I wouldn't get a raise for three or four years. Mm -hmm. And that's just the reality of it. I knew that. I signed up for it. But at some point, you know, you start getting older and, you know, bills start stacking up and I just couldn't afford it. And I, I, I bit the bullet. Yeah. Well, I'll say it's nice to have somebody be honest about that, you know, just, oh, for sure. yeah. just raw Absolutely. and honest yeah. and I tell her what it is. Because everybody, you know, whatever their industry, they, they start at a young age, they work their way up. And at points, you have to make financial decisions to secure your future. So I appreciate that authenticity about it and being honest about it. For sure. And it was, I mean, it was hard. It was a hard transition for me. I'm a, I tell people all the time, I was a prosecutor at heart. I, I, I said it more times than I can count that I would never be a defense attorney. I could never do that to all of my defense attorney buddies when I was a prosecutor. And in hindsight, you know, it was narrow sighted. Mm -hmm. Um, I really enjoy what I do now. The transition was tough in that you go from a social environment where there's 30 or 40 like-minded people, you're surrounded by law enforcement all the time, prosecutors all the time, you feel like you wear the white hat, to you go from that environment to you're in your office by yourself or in the car all the time mm -hmm. with no other like-minded individuals. There's no social aspect of being a defense attorney when yeah. I came out. I was by myself all the time, and I think I struggle with – not only switching sides, but not having that support system and that social aspect of practicing law. It just went from being at a, you know, a, a very social, fun environment to just a very lonely, isolating experience. Sure. Um, and then you add the stress on trying to make a living coming out. That's hard. Right. I mean, I, I've taught, you know, several years and I tell those kids, I'm like, don't ever come out and be just a defense attorney without having the experience of being a prosecutor mm -hmm. um, and getting your name out there and trying cases because you'll, you'll starve to death. Right. There's not enough business for out there without some type of credibility attached to your name. Sure. Um, so I struggle with that. I struggle with not wearing the white hat and I struggled with the social aspects of it. Okay. I did. All right. Do you not have any interest in doing this up in East Texas or up North Texas? You just wanted to come down here and do that. Okay. Did my, you have, go ahead. My parents were getting older. My mm -hmm. parents are, my dad's 88 now. My mom passed away about nine years ago. So my parents were getting older mm -hmm. and it's just something I needed to do is be back close to home and, and yeah. be around them more. Okay. I had the pleasure of meeting your dad not too long ago. Yes, you did. <laughs> Very cool guy. And that, uh, what was it? The Astros tickets. Uh -huh. That was really cool. Yeah. That went viral. That, that caught a couple yeah. hundred thousand uh, views. What was it? We bought him a, he's a huge Astros fan. Okay. Um, we bought him a spring training trip this year. So he's going to go to Kissimmee, Florida with okay. my sister and watch the Astros for three or four days for spring training. Okay. Um, and we gave him um, that for Christmas and my sister filmed it and he just started crying. And so then my sister shared it online and then the Astros picked it up and some reporters picked it up and then Major League Baseball picked it up. The next thing we know is there's a couple hundred thousand views of his video. <laughs> wow. I know, which is... How have I not seen this? It's crazy. It was yeah. cool. I may have seen it, and I just didn't know that that was it. Yeah. I mean, it was a special moment. I it think was. everybody captured that and got to got to taste it. It was really cool. That's, that's real cool. Yeah. So yeah. He's, he's a good guy. He's good. Good. Guy. good. So w what is it... Uh, okay. So as far as criminal justice goes, now when I took my criminal justice classes... It was, it's very pro law enforcement class as far as you're talking about offender behavior, you're talking about, um, I remember learning the different body types of, of criminals. Did you learn that kind Absolutely. of stuff? Psychology. So do you feel like having those classes and taking those prepared you well for law school? Because I didn't take that step. I didn't take the law school step. So I'm just, I don't know how that, how that works. I'm not a big fan of law school. Because they just teach you to pass the bar. Really? Like, honestly, I didn't learn anything in law school. I'll back up. <laughs> I didn't, I, I learned how to pass the bar in law school. I That's how you. law schools make money is bar passage rates. That attracts better students right. who can pay more money right. and more students. So they teach you to pass the bar. They don't teach you how to practice law. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, yeah, I learned quite a bit related to criminal law and criminal procedure and rules of evidence. Um, but as far as being in the courtroom and practicing law, I didn't learn anything in law school that helped me in that respect. Hmm. Um, they just, you know, passed the bar and, and, you know, trial by fire is how I learned. I mean, my prosecutor put me in the courtroom and she sat on my first case and the rest I just tried and I tried, I don't know, close to 60 cases in three and a half years and they were all felony cases. Wow. I mean, you put that in perspective. I mean, Harris County, you usually two or three years before you try your first felony case. You're trying misdemeanors up until that point. Wow. And so my first trial was an aggravated sexual assault of a child. And Jeez. I was, I literally was six months out of law school. I'd never seen a criminal case tried in my life. Wow. I didn't, I, I, and she's like, the case is yours. Go to work. Yeah. And so it was terrifying. I mean, that was the experience at the time was horrific, but in hindsight, it's the best thing that ever could happen to me. Right. Best thing that could ever happen to me. So what do you think when you say that was the best thing that happened to you? What, what was it about it? That was the best thing that could have happened to you. Well, you learn things you never forget. Yeah. You know, it's no one's telling you what to do. That's those things are easy to forget. And you don't, you know, there's always something in the back of my mind from those experiences that, that jog memories that yeah. I remember that served me very, very well in what I do now. Mm -hmm. um, even though I was on the other side, I was prosecuting cases and putting guys in jail um, and bad guys in prison for a long time. Mm -hmm. Having those experiences now, it's, you know, those, those, those stick with you. Right. Um, it's just like anything else, you, you know, hands-on experience, there's no substitute for that. People no. can tell you what to do. Mm -hmm a thousand times and until you do it yourself and realize the mistakes you made mm -hmm. and the things you did wrong and the, how you learn from those things. Right. None of those, you know, people telling you don't really matter. You have to learn those, you know, school right. of hard knocks. That's what, that's what Johnny and I were talking about when we were talking about what he does and what he provides people in relation to, um, well, when it was uh, hatch brands, but just, someone that has that experience of I know what it is to build a business and I know what it is to fail and to succeed and to have that uh, you, you didn't you don't necessarily learn that from somebody teaching you you, you learn it from actually doing it right and that's you know I had a lot of trial experience I mean I tried as many cases I think as any prosecutor in the state of Texas in three and a half years my judge just liked to go to trial and I didn't have anybody to help me and, you know, I learned how to lose cases and I learned how to win cases and mm -hmm. I learned what mattered to juries. Um, we'd talk to a jury every single verdict and every single trial. We'd sit back there for 45 minutes with them. What made a difference? What mattered? What didn't matter? Um, what put it over the edge? What, you know, what, what leaned towards not guilty? And having those, that time with those jurors and those experiences is what I think serves me well now and what I, you know, I feel like that, you know, makes me um, fairly good defense attorney now is that common practice doing that when you when you talk to a jury like that I've never heard it is that. common practice okay. I don't think it's as in-depth as I had it in East Texas because okay. East Texas is a little more laid back sure you know juries in Harris County the, jur the verdicts read and for the most part they want to get out of there but things move in Harris County a little faster than they do in right. Athens Texas so I think they just gave me the luxury of spending a little more time with me okay um, and part of that may have been because I was new I mean, yeah. a lot of juries are like, hey, he's willing to learn. Let's, let's try to help him. Let's did, give him the information that we have. So did you ask for that to happen, or did they say, hey, you can talk to the jury after this? Usually always allow us to do it. Some juries talk to us. vast majority do. Some don't. Okay. You know, some three or four may stick around, and the other nine will leave. Okay. Um, sometimes all 12 will stick around, and they'll, you know, That's give you the feedback. And we always are asking, look, what did we do good? What did we do bad? Why did you vote guilty, or why did you vote, vote not guilty? Um, why did you give the 30 year sentence? You know, that just right. helps you grow and learn because sometimes great you just don't know. Yeah, I, man, I, I, I didn't I even know I had no that. idea. Oh yeah. That's, that's amazing. I, that's the best part of my, of trying a case in my opinion. I mean, win, lose, getting or draw. the feedback it afterwards. Is, Absolutely. You, I mean, you, sometimes you get a little full of yourself and you need to be brought back down to earth. And some right. of these jurors will be honest with you. They're like, look, you didn't do a very good job. Um, you know, you made this argument. We didn't buy it. Um, you were a little too aggressive or you weren't strong enough on the cross-examination. Um, and then they'll bring up things that we completely missed. I mean, we go through these cases with a fine tooth comb, but sometimes we just miss things and or juries pick up on things that we don't see in the courtroom mm -hmm. or they have an opinion about the credibility of a witness that we never even imagined. Right. Um, juries are extremely smart. I think a lot of people don't give them enough credibility. Mm -hmm. um, and that's some of my best learning um, opportunities have come from a jury. That's can, really cool. I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah. Because I just, I've always thought you have it and you 
to have the trial and everybody goes home and then you just sit around to wonder man what happened how, how did how did we lose that or how did we how did we win that i can't believe that and that's that's great information I just it didn't is have any idea we had one one of the last cases i tried when i was a prosecutor in 2006 was a defendant who went on a um, date with a girl ended up um trying to kill her he tried to cut her throat and he broke the knife tried to snap her neck and didn't work so he duct taped her face and her hands and her feet together and put her in the back of a car and then parked her under a tree in august in houston and just hoped that she would suffocate while she's in the car her family's calling this guy saying hey i know you have our daughter i know you have our loved one let her go and he just ignored him he checked on her three days later she's still alive wow he drives her to a bridge in the middle of the night hands and feet duct tape face duct tape and he picks her up and drops her over the bridge into the brazos river and she somehow frees herself and swims to the shore Jeez. crawls wow. up the shoreline oh. goes to a house they call the cops and the cops don't really believe her they're like mm, i'm not sure about this well she walked them down to the river where they could see that she crawled out and we tried that case as a prosecutor and she was 17 or 18 at the time and after this incident, she didn't leave the house for two or three years. Dropped sure. out of school, couldn't leave the house. Her mom was devastated. She testified. And when we were finished, the jury's like, we want to talk to her. And they took her back in private, and they were back there for almost an hour. And they came out, and there wasn't a dry eye in there. I don't know exactly what they talked about, but it changed everybody in that room. Wow. Wow. So that was before a verdict was read, or that was after? That was after. They sentenced him to life. He got life in prison. Good. So what they... So they did their verdict, and they just wanted to talk to her. They wanted to talk to her because they knew how much she was struggling, and they were hoping in some small way they could help her recover. Wow. And it was was one of the most touching moments I've ever seen. I mean, it wasn't a dry in the courtroom. So everybody stayed in the courtroom while they Mm -hmm. went back there and talked? Mm -hmm. And y'all just sat out there for an hour? Just sat outside. Wow. And then we got to talk to the jury after and hearing, you know, their story and what they talked about and how they tried to help her. You know, that was something I'll never forget. That was 12 or 13 years ago. Jeez. It's like it's yesterday. That's crazy. I know. I'm sure those I'm sure those stories that you're talking about right there, I'm sure you just have catalogs of just In hindsight, I wish I would have written down more of them, yeah. honestly, because you know, as time goes on, memories fade. Right. Uh, but uh, we have some good ones. I mean, we do. Okay. Well, I know at some point when we're doing this, and and that's that's something I want to make sure that everybody knows is that we're kind of introducing everybody to Sean so that you know who he is, what he does. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, your practice and, and kind of how it's progressing and transforming. Uh, so, but we're going to get into this, hopefully doing more shows and, and, and speaking about criminal justice and defense and, and just getting into Because, I mean, I just think all this stuff is, is completely fascinating. So uh, yeah, we'll, think, we'll definitely get into that. I think today is more about meeting Sean, everybody meeting him, getting sure. to know him, his yeah. history, his background. For sure. And then later on, as we move forward, we'll get to lo- learn more about law, get to hear more of these stories that are amazing uh, and mostly with good outcomes, as this one was. <laughs> For sure. And then, you know, just kind of take it from there as we go on. But, right. yeah, the goal is to get you in here quite often. Yeah. No, I enjoy it. I yeah, do. Absolutely. So then, Sean, if you don't mind, I'm going to get personal with you. So tell us a little bit. I know we're making a huge transition here from going from what we're still going to get back to what we were talking about. Fair enough. So, I mean, I still got a lot to talk about. But just so people know, because this is about you. We, we want to make this little hat come off. Is that cool? You've already taken your jacket off, so I'm going to take my hat off. Deal. Okay. All right. I don't want everybody to see this bald head. It's obvious I'm losing my hair, so I don't want people to see that. You can laugh, Johnny. It's okay. I thought you were looking at Hector. It's all right. (laughs) This isn't my normal seat. I didn't know who you were talking to. All right. So, um, all right. So, tell us a little about you, a little about your family. Tell us about, uh, just just tell us about you. Gotcha. So, I've been married since 2012. Um, My wife is a nurse and has been for, I guess, going on 20 years. Um, Mm. She is... uh, the assistant director of the emergency room at Texas Children's in Katy. Wow. So she's got a we have similar backgrounds in that she's a bit of a adrenaline junkie in that respect. She was okay. a life flight nurse for quite a while. Yeah. And then ran the ER at Bentob. Yeah. Um, and then ran MD Anderson's Proton Therapy Center for several years. And now she runs the ER at Texas Children's in Katy. She's back in what I call her niche, which is emergency medicine. Okay. 
Uh, we have a five-year-old little girl um, that'll be starting kindergarten uh, in the fall. And we, um, you know, we stay busy. We try to travel as much as we can. Um, yeah. And we, um, we stay busy. We stay busy, which is good. Yeah? Traveling where? Where do you like to travel? You just got back from a long trip. We did. We, uh, Italy. We got wow. married. We got married in Italy in wow. 2012. So we just now took our daughter back to Italy to show her where we got married. Okay. So we just traveled to Italy about, I guess, six weeks ago. Jeez. Yeah. So we stayed there for almost a week with with uh, my mother-in-law and um, her sister and then my uh, my wife's cousin. Okay. So there were five or six of us that went. So. I mean, besides the fact I'm sure it's beautiful there. Why Italy? Why get married in Italy? I mean, I understand why, because it's gorgeous. I, yeah, but, I mean. Are well, y'all Italian? We are not. <laughs> we, were, we were talking about taking a trip um, through Italy, just to go tour, just to, to, just to go tour Italy yeah. um, in the Christmas of 2012. Yeah. We'd been dating for a couple of years, and I'd set up this trip, and we were just going to go essentially backpack Italy just to get away and go do it. No really good reason. That's just really to, cool. It's Italy. Right. And so about a month out, we start talking about, well, what if we got married? And I'm like, that actually sounds like a fabulous <laughs> idea. Of course, like, what am I supposed to say? But it right. was a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And so the day before we left, we sent all of our family and friends a bottle of wine and an announcement. And yeah. we got on the plane. No one knew except our families. Yeah. And then we landed in Rome, got married the next day. And that evening is when everybody got their boxes. So everybody here in the States was celebrating us, celebrating with us as we just finished getting married in Rome. So it was just the two of you? Just the two of us. Wow. Yeah. Did anybody hold any, any ill will towards you guys because they weren't there? Maybe, but they didn't tell us. No. <laughs> no, they kept that secret. <laughs> yeah. Because I would, I would imagine if you do something like that, that families would have liked to have been there and done all that. So that's why I asked. It was our second marriage for both of us. Okay. And so I think we had that big grand wedding that you know yeah. we all want when we're younger. Yeah. And we both knew that that really wasn't what we were looking for this time around. Right. So it worked out well. The families were supportive of it. They understood why we wanted to do it. Yeah. And it, you know, worked out really well. Hey, you got to say you got married in Italy. Got married I mean, in Italy. That's, that's yeah, not a lot in of Rome. people that can say And now that. You, have a, you have a reason to go back on a regular basis. Yeah. And, you know, taking our daughter back and right. her being able to see where we got married and see the photos and put the photos to the places. It was, right. It's a really good experience for us. It's really special because she actually, you know, at five, she was really interested. Right. And she seemed to really care, and that meant a lot to us. Wow. Yeah. So the wife is an ER nurse, basically. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. So, man, I, I bet you two have great stories to tell each other at night when both of you get home. I can imagine with you being what you do and her being in an, in an ER all the time, I bet it's pretty interesting dinner conversation. It is. It is. I mean, we... um. I think part of the reason I'm in criminal law is because it's exciting. I mean, you see different, something different every single day. Right. You talk to some really good people who make bad decisions, and yeah. you talk to some really horrific people that mm -hmm. need to be put away. You mm -hmm. just do. And it's, I think, the same thing with her. You have really good people who have made a, you know, a dumb decision and got hurt, or they have some children who are in there, and you, know, you, can, you can really help people. Yeah. And you get to meet a lot of people from a, different, a lot of different walks of life. Yeah. I think was important. So... I know you could sit here and just think about it, but craziest story you've heard from your wife coming home from an, from an ER situation. Can you think of anything just off the top of your head? Right now, first thing that comes to mind is my wife being back in a children's ER. Mm -hmm. It's the tragedies that she sees with the drownings in Ooh, the summer. Man. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Is it's, it's not anything exciting. It's, it's just devastating, and she brings it home. I mean, you have kids coming in every single day who fell in a swimming pool and drowned wow. and, and seeing these devastated families, right? You know, as we get through the summer, it's, you know, you don't see it as much, but during the summertime, it's every single day. It seemed like she came home with a, you know, with a, another tragedy that, you know, it wears on her. It oh, does. for sure. Well, Absolutely. shit, let's uh, couple that with a, a beautiful story with a good ending. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what, what kind Talking of... Talking about a buzzkill shot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's, that's the first thing that came to mind. Yeah. She, um, yeah. She's got a lot of good stories from flying on the helicopter. Oh, and she's been on the... She was a life flight nurse oh, okay. for quite a while, for uh, four or five years. Okay. She flew in with PHI, the yellow helicopter you see flying around. Yeah. She flew on that helicopter for a long, for, I don't know, five years. Wow. So... That's the reason she won't let me get a motorcycle. Uh, She's like, I've scraped too many people off the road. 
Um, you're not getting a motorcycle. It's being able to help people because when they call the life flight, someone's sick. Yeah. And she was really good at what she did. Yeah. And so she's, she takes a lot of pride in that, that she's in that really high stress with somebody that's really, really sick and yeah. being able to really, really help them yeah. and almost immediately help them. Yeah. In that seven, eight minute flight back to the hospital. That's awesome. Is those stories, she, there's nothing else she does that brights her up as talking about being on a life oh, flight. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. She really enjoyed that. That's awesome. Yeah. So, and you're living in the Sugarland area? We Is live in right? Riverstone. In Riverstone. Yeah. And so that's kind of where, when you're practicing, you're practicing out of Sugarland, right? Correct. Okay. All right. So where is your where is your office in Sugarland? I'm Derry Ashford, just south this north sorry, this south of here, about I don't know, three exits. Three exits, yeah. Okay. There's a Comerica building right there at Derry oh, Ashford, yeah, fifty nine. Yeah. yeah, I know you're talking about. Take a ride at the Comerica building, I'm down about a quarter mile. I know what you're talking about. Okay. We All lived right. in Pearland until two thousand fourteen. My wife was born and raised in Pearland. Okay. And I was like, We need to move to Sugarland. That's my Yeah. My home base and the drive was wearing on me and I I considered running for office out here, so we came looking at houses and she fell in love with Riverstone and we moved out here in 2014 and we'll make this our home for the rest of our life. So uh, that, that's a, that's a transition right there. So you're saying you're running for office, what off DA? I ran for DA, okay. um, in March of last year in the primary and okay. was defeated. Okay. And then, um, the individual who defeated me ran against the current DA, Brian Middleton. Okay. And Brian Middleton won, the Democrats won pretty much swept Fort Bend County. Okay. So hmm. thankfully I lost in the primary. I would have spent a lot more money and time and resources and probably would have been defeated in November just as my opponent was. What do you think attributed to the Democrats winning Sugar Land or Fort Bend? Or is that another conversation? No, I think just being uh, Republicans have a bad name right I, now. I, I mean, it's, it's just you have a president who can be divisive mm -hmm. and – this party politics and you have to either believe in everything that he does or you believe in nothing that he does if you're on the other side right. is, is, is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. I think you need to vote for people because they're qualified and not necessarily the party affiliation. Right. But that's just the nature of what it is. He, you know, he's rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not many people in the Republican Party who are doing the outreach that we need to try to put those fires out and to bring new people into the Republican Party. We just don't have that outreach or we didn't. I know that um, J.C. Jaton, who's the current um, chairman of the Republican Party in Fort Bend, is, is trying to do everything he can to initiate that outreach. Yeah. But it, it, well, maybe a lot we, of the Republican Party is not open to that. Maybe we can give him a new platform with this. Absolutely. He yeah. would love to come in. I'll We'd tell you now, yeah. he's, he's a really, really good guy. We'd yeah. love to get him in here. Yeah, and, and wants to do the right thing. He's, he's what I would hope more Republicans would be like is – you know, let's let's not be so divisive. Let's be more inclusive right. and accepting. Absolutely, absolutely, and kind. Yeah. Frankly, for sure, because I think that happens. I think you get this this idea that Republicans are bad and Democrats are good, mm -hmm. and and that Democrats care and Republicans don't, and that's further from the truth. Right. In in my experience, um, you know, so I, I haven't experienced that. Yes, there are people out there in that part of it that are way off the rails and that I, me personally want to have nothing to do with and they don't represent me at all and you have the same thing on the other side you have that also and so i'm with you it's i i think there's really good people in the middle 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 right that aren't getting enough credit or aren't getting enough of a platform right i guess i mean i say. think 90 percent of the uh, both sides of each party are perfect we all have everything we in, in common we see the same things the same ways. Right. You have the vocal 5% that everybody, that gets all the attention. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for whatever reason, people believe that they speak for the party. Right. And it's, you know, it's that's it's the driving That's the driving force of what makes people make their decisions. Absolutely. Is that 5%? Yeah. Is that we lost a lot of good candidates out here. Right. That would have been fantastic judges. And mm -hmm. we lost a lot of good judges by people who weren't as qualified. But it was simply a voting down party lines, and you just were on the wrong side. Why did you want to run for DA? I truly thought I could make a difference. I really did. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm competent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like I know the system. I know everybody in Fort Bend County, and the DA was retiring after 26 years. Yeah. 
And it just felt like a perfect situation for me. The timing, you know, timing is everything. Right. In hindsight, it didn't work out. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, it just seemed like a, a, a perfect opportunity for me. We were in a good place financially, a good place personally. My wife was extremely supportive. And it just seemed like the right avenue for me. Right. Um, and I jumped at the chance. I really did. It took me a couple of days. Just the, the fear of running for office, because I'm not a political guy. I mean, I don't like putting myself out there. It's just not who I am. Yeah. Um, and so putting myself and my family out there was difficult for me to get over, but there was right. so much to gain. And I thought we could do some really good work out here in Fort Bend County. Like what, when you say, when, when you have people say, I think, feel like I could make a difference or we could do good work. Like what, what kind of work is that you're talking about? Well, I, criminal justice is always been pretty pretty bright line rule it's you know right. it's you either you're doing good or you're doing bad mm -hmm. and if you do bad you need to get punished um and there wasn't much gray area it's you know if you got in trouble for possession of marijuana then you're going to have a conviction on your record and it's going to follow you the rest of your life mm -hmm. and i think in the last six or eight ten years with the change in the laws and you know you have eight or ten states now where marijuana is legal and then you have an 18 year old kid who's smoking weed in texas and he gets arrested do we really want that to follow him the rest of his life where he, you know, look, the, the, the whole purpose of the system is to not see defendants come back. Correct. I mean, we don't want crimes to be committed. The best way to do that if someone gets in trouble is to reform them so they never come back. And so my, my whole argument with this, and again, this is not Republican DAs, are, would, I would say the vast majority are tougher on crime. Democrats are a little more lenient. That's just in general. Mm -hmm. I was kind of in the middle. I'm like, if there's an 18 year old kid who gets arrested for marijuana, do I want to put a conviction on his record that'll prevent him potentially from going to school or getting a job or bettering himself because somebody sees this conviction and they hold it against him and he has it on his record for the rest of his life? Mm -hmm. Or do we want to say, okay, you got arrested for marijuana. Let's see if we can send you into a diversion program. Mm -hmm. You stay clean. You take a drug class. You know what you're getting into. You know the risk and, um, of, of smoking marijuana and, and right. the damage it can do to you. And if you successfully do that and handle your business and be responsible, then we'll dismiss your case and we'll, we'll erase it from your record. So now you're an 18-year-old kid. You've got drug education. Um, you've done some community service. You've been held accountable. You've got a clean record. You've got a clean record now. And now you've learned a valuable lesson at 18 years old, and it's not going to haunt you the rest of your life. Sure. And, I, you know, that's, that was a big part of my platform, that and mental health, is that we need some more resources for mental health. And I, I think I'm quoted as saying that 50 to 75% of my clients have some type of mental health disorder. Oh, sure. To the degree that it affects their everyday life, no. But a diagnosable mental health disorder, absolutely. And well, there's, we don't have the resources to treat that. And if you don't treat the underlying mental health, a lot of these guys are self-medicating because they don't have the drugs to treat their mental health issues. So, yeah, you can, you can convict them 15 times of, of, of taking Adderall or, or using amphetamine or smoking weed. Mm -hmm. But if you don't treat the underlying mental health issues, drug treatment is not going to do any good. Right. That, that you're not treating the underlying issues. They're going to be back. Correct. So let's try to steer a little more money towards the mental health aspect of our system that's been um, sadly ignored. Do you think that's one of the reasons why you didn't get – the, the Republican nomination because you were a little bit more. I don't. Think I hate so. the word. I hate to use the word liberal because I, I, I hate that word. But I think some people in a Republican platform would look at that and go, "That's a little bit more liberal than what I want to do." I think part of that. I'm more moderate. I will. I mean, I'm. I'm. But I am. If you're hurting somebody, if you're hurting children, if you're hurting other individuals in our society, you need to go away. So I'm very. I'm very conservative in that respect, mm -hmm. but I'm a little more moderate with, you know, these, these petty crimes to follow these kids the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I did a lot of Republicans that are very conservative. Did that concern them? I think so. But I think in the end, you have a lot of people who have kids and have grandkids, and they're like, yeah, I mean, it is marijuana, and yeah, he, he's still going to have to be on a probation. He's still going to have to do the right things, and if he does what he's supposed to and he stays clean— Let's give them a second chance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think that resonates with people. I think that makes sense to people. Yeah. 
Um, but in the end, for me, and, and just for politics, it's name recognition. Sure. I mean, I ran against a retired district judge who had been elected out here several times. He's born and raised in Fort Bend County. He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. He's well-respected. Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm, I haven't been in politics. I, I haven't. I don't run in those circles. Yeah. And so I had an uphill battle um, to get the name recognition, and we just couldn't get there. We just didn't have enough time and money and resources to get there. But you, I, I would assume then that means you came from being a criminal law defense attorney to go back into the DA. Is that right? That's right. Okay. That's a, that's quite a leap to go out and then back in. Right. Is that, is that normal? Do people make those kinds of moves like that? I would think it, once you're out, you're out. Typically, if you have an opponent or have someone who's running for a DA yeah. position, they're typically a defense attorney uh -huh. because you have a, um, incumbent district attorney. So nobody in the district attorney's office is going to run against their boss. That's true. So if they're going to have an opponent, it's, it's yeah. always a defense attorney. Okay. Uh, and the majority of those, I don't know that to be true, but I would think the majority of those uh, have been prosecutors before. Okay. So for me, the transition is, in my mind, would have been, would have been easy. I mean, I, all these prosecutors in the DA's office, I, I think every single one of them were personal friends of mine. I mean, I know them very well. Yeah. I know the office. I know how it runs. Uh, so the transition going from defense attorney to prosecutor – that never concerned me. Okay. Never yeah. concerned me. I, I, I guess I never thought about it in that terms. You always, well, I say you always, I guess you just think that you get from a point where you're in the, you're in the office and then you just kind of build your way up. I just think that once you're out, you're, you're, you're out. Like you're just, you don't have any interest in, in going back in and doing that. And I do because in, in deep down inside, I think I'm a prosecutor at heart. Yeah just because I have such fond memories of doing what I did for so long. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people don't want to do it because it is a pay cut um, going back to be the elected DA. It is, and it's a, you know, it's, it's more time, less money. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that's not appealing to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I just felt like it was honestly felt like it was a calling for me. I really did. Yeah. Do you think you'll run again? I think so. I do. I've thought about it. I'm not there yet, but two years, three years, I think it's something that's on the horizon. So the if, if the Republican Party can do a better job in Fort Bend County with outreach and being more inclusive um, than they have been. You don't, that's, think, that's, you don't think they have been? No, and I think it's evident with the election. I mean, they swept, Democrats swept, and they hadn't done that since, I don't know, 80s? Yeah. So they swept every single race. But when you say that about inclusion, what do you think they're not doing right now that's, that's creating that atmosphere? I think just outreach. I mean, being, you know, out, look, Fort Bend County is the most diverse community in the nation. Oh, yes. And. Well, I think that between, you know, all of the foreigners and millennials who are now stepping up to the plate because everybody dislikes Trump, that that's what you're competing with. And that's who has the voice and who's actually using their voice. And that's, people think the Republican party is Trump. Yeah. And I'm like, that's not the Republican party. Right. And it, you know, I, it, there's nothing that frustrates me more than to ask somebody, well, you're Republican. Yes. Do you believe everything Trump is doing? Absolutely. He's the greatest president ever. He can do no wrong. Right. And I'm like, are you married? Yeah. Can your spouse do no wrong? Oh no, my spouse. And I'm like, so you, you believe more in the president can do no wrong than you do your own spouse. Right. And I'm like, and that's, you know, people buy into that. And it's, it's that party politics that you, it's all or nothing. I believe in everything he does. Or if you're a Democrat, I believe in nothing. There's some things Trump does that I think are outstanding. Mm -hmm. There's some things that make me want to bury my head in the sand. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's just, and if anybody Absolutely. that can look you in the face and say anything different is I don't, I can't comprehend that. That's Correct. just not human nature. And mm -hmm. it's, it's that party politics that is so divisive that you can't have a reasonable conversation with those people. Right. You can't. Mm -hmm. We could disagree. Right. You know, yeah, Trump does great things. He does bad things. But in the end, we want, you know, we're good people. We're nice. We want everybody to be successful. We're caring. Mm -hmm. And I, I think he's done, he's set back the Republican Party quite a bit because mm -hmm. we need to reach out to the minority community, communities here in Fort Bend County and say, look, Trump doesn't represent us. Mm-hmm. You know, he, we agree with some things he does, but there's a lot we don't. 
Well, so we're not we're not everything that we're not as bad as you think we are. Well, and and that's why I asked the question with you in regards to do you think sometimes your policies in relation to uh, the vices, I guess, drugs. Um, I, I can't remember what else you you were you were talking about, but um, I think sometimes when you don't lay in line with the Republican mindset when it comes to crime and justice, and you know making sure that those people pay, that you even inside your own party that you're not Republican enough, and that to me is what the frustrating part is: is that you say no, no, no. I mean, I can still believe in these things as far as uh, fiscal conservatism and, 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 and justice whenever somebody deserves it, but also when somebody doesn't deserve it, like, it's okay to be lenient with these people. It doesn't mean that you're, you're not the criminal, you know, you're not a justice guy, like people don't get you. I mean, like, it's okay to, to care, you know? And, and I think that's what is lacking sometimes, at least in the, in the Republican Party, is people think they don't care. And it's, you know, there's been such a shift in criminal justice um, enforcement in that We've all been in fights in schools. Right. Were you ever arrested for fighting in a school? Right. I wasn't. No. Were you? No. Absolutely not. Well, now almost every single fight in high school, somebody gets arrested. Yes. How many times did cops take you home if you were drinking and driving when you were a kid? You hear about stories like that all the time 15, 20 years ago. Pour your beer out, get in the car, I'll take you home. Mm -hmm. You have a little weed. Look, I'll, just, I'll flush it down the toilet, I'll put it in the drain, just go home. Mm -hmm. Well, now it, there's been a bit of a shift because of body cams and car cameras and you know more accountability that, that law enforcement doesn't cut breaks like that anymore that they used to on the scene that we would never see. So now every DWI is getting arrested. Every kid with marijuana is getting arrested. Every fight in school, someone's going to jail when 75% of those were sent on a diversion program at the time, get lectured, go tell your family, your dad whoops your ass, that's the end of it. So now you gotta go to court for six months and you're gonna have a record the rest of your life. Right. Well. We haven't adjusted our system in court to reflect the changes that have been made on the scene. Mm -hmm. All those kids now are having arrest records before they just get a, a talking to and, and get grounded for a week. And so we all didn't mind it back then. Right. And, you know, we all have kids. We've all made mistakes. We've all made bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And does a bad decision need to haunt you the rest of your life to keep you from being a teacher? Absolutely. From right. keeping you from going to law school. And so that was always my concern is people want a safe society. You don't have anybody here say, well, I want a society with no marijuana. I'm not a fan of marijuana. I'll be the first to tell you. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. I've seen it destroy a lot of lives. I have. Mm -hmm. um, I have a skewed perspective of it. But, you know, let's, uh, the best thing I ever heard was let's, Let's punish the ones that make mistakes and let's lock up the ones we're scared of. Mm. No, that, I, I haven't heard that before, but that's, that's a good, because I'm the same way. And, and that's what Harris County's doing, correct? Harris County is doing, doing a program similar to what you're talking about. They right? are, they okay. are. And I'm not, a, I'm not necessarily a big fan of that either, but okay. it is a, it's, a, it's a move in the right direction. I'm not sure I would go that far. How, f what, f how far is it they've taken it that it's you're? That they write tickets for every single marijuana case now. Okay. Um, and rather than, my understanding is they've taken that decision out of the hands of law enforcement, whether to arrest you or not. Because look, sometimes when a kid is found with marijuana, they need to be arrested. They got a bad attitude. Um, they're up to no good. They're doing something, that, but you can't catch them doing it. Uh, they need to go to jail. I think you need to leave those decisions to law enforcement on the scene. Mm -hmm. um, and don't prevent them from making these arrests that they may need to make. I'm with you. So, I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of giving law enforcement discretion. So that's what it's doing, basically, is just taking the decision out of law enforcement hand? Correct. Is there a certain quantity of marijuana that that's regulated by? I think it's less than two ounces. Okay. I think. Um, and do you think Fort Bend will move in that direction or follow suit anytime in the near future? I don't think so in the near future. I know there's been a policy change this week or last week that if it's marijuana, it may be under one ounce that you take Deuce Community Service, take a drug ed education offender program, mm -hmm. and they'll dismiss the case. That's just happened. The first time I saw it was today. Similar to what you're talking about. Essentially, he's pre-trial. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll dismiss your case. And you can get it off your record. That's a happy medium. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's nice. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, you know, I think the goal needs to be at some point, we need to educate these kids that marijuana is not just some herb that you smoke and it's not going to affect you mentally. 
um, or psychologically. It is. It mm -hmm. is. And kids just don't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, so give them some education and don't prevent them from being successful because they have a, a criminal conviction on the record because they smoked weed once and got caught. Yeah. I'm with you there. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's the thing about the uh, law enforcement is I, I do think there's people look at law enforcement as black and white. And, and I do think there is some gray there. I do think there, there is should some, be. There is some interpretation there. And like you said, when you're taking it out, of, in my opinion, when you're taking it out of law enforcement hand, they're the one, they're the boots on the ground. They're the ones that are making that decision. And right. I mean, if there's a kid screwing around, doing something he shouldn't do, and he doesn't look like he's posing any threat to anybody other than himself. And you just say, Hey, look, okay, I got you move on. Let's let, don't let me see you again. I, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I mean, I'm the same way. It's yeah. Do we want law enforcement, five officers making a marijuana arrest and taking them off the streets? Or do we want them maybe, hey, okay, I'll give you a ticket. Uh, you need to report to court in three months, two months, uh, and let me go try to, you know, catch the guys breaking into houses and committing ag robberies. It's, you know, it's a, it's a cost of balances. Right. At some point, it's, you know, is that the best use of their resources? Right. No, I, I agree with that. I mean, that's, that's a huge deal, right? And that's why I said this is something you could talk about for— You could— for for hours just because of the way that the laws are changing and the way that not like you said states are becoming to accept marijuana and, and it's starting to uh, be something that's a little bit more widely accepted around around the world especially and around the country too now i guess which yep. is surprising and you, it's a mixed message for these kids yeah so obviously sean you're you're extremely understanding and qualified as far as the things that you're talking about and i know as we go and progress as far as our shows go we're going to learn more i mean I'm, I'm excited to learn more because this i can i can talk about this stuff all day so but i, I think what i want to go to next is we kind of started talking about we got off track so we're talking about your personal we're talking about your family so kind of give us a little bit more of your background just kind of how you've what you've done as far as we talked about schooling saint mary's uh, but kind of give us a little bit more background as far as what your qualifications are and what you're doing. Just a little bit deeper dive into, okay. into that. Fair enough. So in East Texas, um, like we talked about, I tried a lot of cases. And yeah. one of the um, benefits, in hindsight now I can say that, was if you tried a case and you won, you also wrote the appeal to the Court of Appeals. So I'm checking my work for every conviction. So most wow. large DA's offices have a appellate division and all they do is write appeals that's their job well in east texas you wrote your own appeals okay so and i had to read my own transcripts and how i spoke and listen to myself talk so that really kind of shaped and, and, and seeing and making sure you're very cognizant of the law okay um, because i had to check my own work so right. that was something that was very beneficial um, when i came out to fort Bend county i left after a couple years and i'd always been interested in teaching Okay. So I had the opportunity at Thurgood Marshall School of Law, um, wanted to create an Innocence Project, which is a nationwide organization who essentially does conviction integrity in investigations. Okay. So someone's been convicted of a crime in the 80s. There's a DNA sample, but they didn't have the technology to test it at the time. Uh -huh. They now can test it. So someone, say, was convicted of rape in 1985. They couldn't do DNA testing. Now in 2005, they could do DNA, DNA testing, and the DNA comes back to not belonging to the individual who's been convicted of the crime. The Innocence Project then steers that appellate process in attempting to get those individuals released from prison. You started that? I started that at Thurgood Marshall. Okay. Wow. So they wanted an wow. Innocence Project Good at that at historically black university. Yeah. It was the fourth one in Texas. Yeah. So they brought me in to create that program. Um, Okay. While I was there, I taught crim law to first-year law students. I was a um, trial simulator, trial simulation instructor. Okay. Where I taught kids how to try cases, and then I sat and supervised third-year law students who defended cases in Harris County. So we'd get appointed to a case, and then law students would defend it, which is the opportunity I never had in law school. But now these kids are actually trying cases real as third cases? year law students, real cases. Wow. And I sat and supervised them. So I taught kids how to try cases. Um, I did that for almost two years. I then went to um, practicing again full time and then started teaching at HBU. I taught uh, government, U.S. and Texas government at HBU. And now I'm assisting North American University um, with getting their criminal justice program up and running. Wow. Um, so that's been, you know, it's just kind of a niche that I've enjoyed. I yeah. enjoy teaching um, and kind of sharing my experiences. 
Um, and that, that, that gives me, you know, some satisfaction that, that I think keeps me motivated. I bet being able to see kids get into what you're getting into. I mean, I'm sure that's, that's fantastic. It is. It's, you know, and it's, I have a lot of good experience in that respect. I can right. teach kids how to try cases, and I know criminal law. I don't know much about anything else, but that's something I do know about is criminal law. Mm -hmm. and so it's, you know, it's fun teaching other kids about those things. That's good. I enjoy it. That's awesome. Yeah. I never heard of the Innocence Project. I mean, is that something that is just for third grade martial school? Is that something that's kind of moving out to other pe places? or is it It's just nationwide. There? So it started okay. in New York, and okay. there's, I don't know, there's probably 100, maybe, I'm guessing, 100 programs, 150 programs throughout the nation. Okay. So there's four in Texas. Thurgood was the last one, maybe five now. And so we just essentially prisoners would write you and say, look, I'm innocent of this crime. Can you investigate? And then we have students who start gathering data and gathering evidence, and we review it to see if there's an actual innocence claim that we can prove. Wow. So, and it's, you know, there's, I don't know, several hundred exonerations. Good for y'all. Yeah. That's so awesome. It's, it's, you know, I think everybody agrees it's the right thing to do. Absolutely. So you don't want anybody in prison for a crime they didn't commit. Oh, man. I mean, you, you hear more and more about it now. I mean, these, like you said, these crimes that happened 20 years ago that sadly people had nothing to do with. That's right. And, and I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an awesome project you guys are doing. That's it's, fantastic. It's, it's, um, we never had the opportunity to find someone that was actually innocent through our program. Yeah. But we've been present where it's, you know, it's happened and you see the joy on their family and, and oh, his, his clients. This, you know, it's something you'll never forget. That's good. Yeah. That's awesome. So I, I guess we were talking earlier about you and the individual as far as the individual just working your own cases. But I guess from what Johnny was telling me, you're kind of moving into a little bit more, uh, Larger, larger firm, I guess, to, sit, to speak, right? Yep. So I've, uh, I've always practiced on my own until about 2015, 2016, when I was um, appointed to the Sandra Bland investigation out of Waller County. And one oh, of the yeah. individuals who was also appointed to be a special prosecutor with me was a, a, a lady by the name of Phoebe Smith. Okay. And we just immediately hit it off. And she's done a lot of capital defense work and has been a defense attorney her entire life. And we just hit it off, and that kind of opened my eyes to, well, you know, for the last decade, I've been missing this social aspect of my practice. Um, and we started discussing partnering up. We were a good fit. We worked well together. Um, yeah. She seems to enjoy the things that I don't and vice versa. <laughs> so um, That yin and yang. Yeah, and I mean, she's yeah. just very organized and very on top of, of things like that. Yeah. Um, that's, I want to be in the courtroom. I want to be in the courtroom and argue and talk to a jury and witnesses. I don't want to do the mundane behind the scenes, gathering offense reports and making sure they're all organized. It's just not me. Research. And That's all right. That. Yeah. Um, and she did, she, she enjoys that. So we formed our partnership in 2016. And then just recently with a change in administration, um, in my humble opinion, the best prosecutor trial prosecutor in the DA's office, um, her contract was not renewed and she'd been the chief of the domestic violence division for a long, long time and, and tried, countless of huge cases um, in Fort Bend County yeah. and the opportunity presented uh, itself to bring it on I think one of the best trial prosecutors in Fort Bend County um, and now she's doing defense work with us her name's Amanda Bolin Amanda Bolin she okay. just joined our firm about two weeks ago and oh, we're wow. just now starting to to get our you know logo and website and starting to push our marketing and and, and getting her up to speed and on board and okay. helping her with that change in the mindset that I struggled with yeah. Um, from being a lifelong prosecutor of 12 years, I think, or 13 years, and right. now having to go to the defense side for, you know, not a, not a decision on your own, something sure. you just had to kind of deal with, and luckily there was a door there that we could open for, and she jumped on board. And I think you said you played sports, right, when you were in school? And from what I'm gathering, because I'm the same way, I played sports in school, you miss that team environment, right? Mm -hmm. and, you do. And, and I can imagine when you're a defense attorney on your own like that, that you kind of miss that. I think you, you talked about it, but that camaraderie or that team work. It's, you know, and it's, I, I'm a competitor. Right. I mean, I like to win. I like to compete. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, I've always competed with other like-minded individuals, football, volleyball, soccer. Uh, and so having that again, it's, it's kind of invigorated me. It's a, it's a new outlook I have on defense work. It's much more fun. We have a good time at the office. We all, you know, get along. We have our own investigator now who just left the DA's office, Colleen Herman. She was a, an investigator for years as a law enforcement officer, and she left the DA's office about six months ago, and she came on board now. Um, 
and she's been wonderful. So we have an in-house investigator. So it's, you know, it's just, we've got a really good atmosphere that fosters some really good trial work. And that's what's important to me is, is, is we bill ourselves as trial attorneys. Yeah. And that's important to me because that's, well, that's I think what that's about. It is. I mean, you, if, if you're not a good trial attorney, I don't think you can be a good defense attorney. Right. You well, just it can't. seems like you have the perfect team now. We are we, some we strong, are, talented women. We're exactly. I know. I need some more guys, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> I do. You got those. Got those strong, talented. You can come hang out with us. I once know. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> Me and my onesie. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, you've got to bring the ladies of the law firm. Yeah, in. for sure. They have, they've been talking about it. I told them I was coming on today, and they're excited about it. And yeah. They, um, we just. It's. I don't want to lose sight of we have a very good opportunity right now, and I, don't, I, I want to take advantage of that. That's good. Really enjoy what we're doing. That's awesome. Yep. Well, we'll what, look forward to meeting them. Well, yeah. Well, and, right. and, and like we said, this is this is going to be a regular. I mean, because I can definitely talk more about this. I got questions. And what we kind of talked about during the break is there's always going to be something to talk about. There's always going to be something in the news, something going on that's going to require us to get somebody like yourself or Phoebe uh, and Amanda, you Amanda. Said, on to ask questions of because I think for people out there listening or watching, I think just lack of knowing is what affects so many people as far as what do I do if this happens to me? What right. do I do if I get pulled over for this? What, what do I do? It's fear of the unknown. Correct. It is. And I mean, we, we work very hard with making their initial contact with our office very relaxed, very laid back. Um, they have my, my clients have my cell phone number. They can text me. They can call me. Um, we try to be what they don't expect with that stuffy, hard, um, um, difficult to work with, not right. responsive. We, we are, are focusing our, our firm on not being those attorneys that people expect. Not having a stick up your ass. Yeah. I mean, we want to go. Absolutely. I mean, this is their life. They're trusting us to some of them, frankly, to their life. I mean, right. And. You know, it's. I think that's that's served me well, and that I'm I'm just a pretty personable guy, and I truly want to help people. Some we can help, we really can. Some we can't. I'm mm -hmm. like, look, I'm gonna. I, all best I can do is make sure you're treated fairly, but I, the facts are the facts. I can't change the facts. Right. I can make sure that they're gonna do everything the right way, right. and make sure that your rights are preserved. But in the end, you know, if you did something horrific, the chances are you're gonna get convicted of it. Because that's what a defense, I mean, obviously you're going to talk more about this as we do more shows, but that's what a defense attorney does. I think a lot of people think a defense attorney gets off criminals. No. And, and that's, that's the farthest thing from the truth. The defense attorney is there to make sure their client is going by, is, is in the system properly, is the rules of law are followed, and that they are defended to the best that they can be within the law. And that's absolutely true. And I, you know, what I take great pride in is I am very respectful of everybody in the courthouse, from mm -hmm. prosecutors to staff to judges. I'm a, I feel like I'm a pretty well-liked guy. Um, and I've always been very respectful and considerate. And mm -hmm. I think that goes a long way with when you're trying to get a break for your client. Sure. Is that you have some credibility. You're competent. Um, everybody knows that you are familiar with the law and you know what you're talking about mm -hmm. and you can go about it in a respectful and honest right. dialogue. I think that that it's a large part what makes us as successful as we are is that That's we good. are able to get deals and get answers for our clients that uh, many attorneys can't do just because we have those relationships and we foster those relationships. Right. Um, and and it, it goes both ways. I mean, if and the prosecutors can can come to us and give us their honest assessment of the case, we can honestly disagree professionally and go have a beer at the end of the day. Right. And we do that every single day. And it's, you know, it's taken me a long time not to take it personal when people tell me, no, no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not going to give your client a break. No, I'm not going to, you know, dismiss his case. Right. Um, and, you know, sometimes you disagree, but in the end, I think everybody's heart's in the right place. Right. And we're respectful of those decisions. And it, you know, that's, I think that's where it's placed us where we're at, that, that we're, we're up there with, with, with getting results that, that um, we're very proud of. Good. Well, we can, like I said, we can talk about this later on because I, I could keep going. But just so we can end it, just let people know if they need to, how to contact you. We're going to continue to give people this information, but okay. just to end it, just kind of tell people uh, 
how they can contact you and, and uh, a little bit of your information there. All right. So our firm name is Smith McDonald Bolin. So Phoebe Smith, Sean McDonald, Amanda Bolin. And you can contact us at 713-228-2523. Okay. Um, and we're still working on building our website with a new firm name and all that. That should be up and running if Jonathan is worth his weight in about <laughs> two hours. <laughs> I'll have it. Up. Did, are we doing the, crim, was it criminaldefense.co? I don't know yet. All right. We have like 10 of them out there. Cool. Well, we're going to put it all on the, uh, at the end of the video, we'll have it all flash up. Also, you're going to be in here on a regular basis, you and the ladies. Yeah. Uh, so we'll definitely get that information out. People Perfect. know how to get in contact with you. Because we good. want people when they get down to it and they think of somebody to do, a de need a defense attorney, when we want them to think of Sean McDonald. Well, good. I hope so. Sean, I really appreciate you coming yeah, no on. Yeah. Thanks for having it's me. It's been amazing. This. Yeah, this yep. was good to, good to meet you, man. All right, I'm, man. I'm glad I finally got a chance to All do right. it. Looking well, forward to hey, it. Hey, y'all uh, wear pants next time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. You're not supposed to let people behind the curtain. <laughs> All right, guys. All right, man. All right, take yeah. care.